Hello folks, this is Jörg Lisman once again from YouTube channel Jokler66 with another reading of the book Rulers of Evil from F. Tapper Saucy. The book Rulers of Evil from F. Tapper Saucy was written in 1996 during 10 years that he was a fugitive all over America because he was so called a, <laughs> a person who didn't like to pay his taxes. Anyway, we have been reading chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6 for a part, so I will continue now in reading in chapter 6. But for continuation matters I will back up a little bit um, to the last page where we were, that was on page 39. And we were reading the last two paragraphs, or the last paragraph of that page, but I will back up one paragraph for continuous sake so that you can better follow right now. But the higher God avoided human matter, and so lordship over the material world belonged to Sataniel, the evil brother of Jesus. Sataniel alone could enrich mankind. Templar Kabbalah represented Sataniel as the head of a goat emblazoned with, sometimes contained within, a pentagram. This symbol is deeply rooted in Old Testament Kabbalah, in which the goat is identified with power in the world and separation from God. One of the greatest Israelite feast days, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, one goat was spared the sacrificial knife and was sprinkled with the blood of another goat killed for the sins of Israel. The spared goat, the scapegoat, was then banished from the congregation to bear Israel's sins into the wilderness, which typified the world. The scapegoat escaped with his life, his freedom. Now I want to mention some things here uh, about the things that Tapper Saucy wrote in this little paragraph because it's, um, you know, he says this symbol is deeply rooted in the Old Testament Kabbalah, the pentagram. And when you want to know what the pentagram just stands for, you have to go to Isaiah 14 and see the five eyes of Lucifer in there. And then you will understand that much better. This is namely when you read from Isaiah 14, I uh, take this of course from the King James Bible, and you read Isaiah 14 verse 12 and following, quote, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. End quote. Now, if you very well count it, these were the four eyes of Satan. These were the, four, uh, the five characteristics were to identify his pride that brought him to the fall. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the lords. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds and I will be like the Most High. What is that? I will be like God? That's blasphemy, right? That's blasphemy in our time and that was blasphemy in Lucifer's time when he was still in heaven. The point being is, Tapa Saucy mentions here the pentagram. The pentagram is the five-pointed star. And today you have this all over the world in two different versions. One version is the star pointing up, <coughs> like for example on the American flag you have that. And the other one is um, the star pointing down. When you have the star pointing down, then there is often a picture, and I will include that into the video, that you can see that for yourself, where they insert a goat's head, and that is the Baphomet, and the Baphomet is an indigenous god, means he has both sex symbols. He has breasts, and he has a phallus coming out between his legs. And this represents Satan, and this represents Lucifer. When the star is pointing up, it is representing Luciferianism, the five-pointed star, and when it is pointed down, it represents Satan. But when you represent Lucifer, you are already in rebellion with God, 
because God changed the name Lucifer to Satan when he threw him out of heaven and a third of the angels that followed him. So that already is rebellion enough. But then of course you have the rebellion of Lucifer himself in this five different points. I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, I will also sit upon the mount of the congregation, I will ascend above the heights of the cloud and I will be like the most high. Those four eyes are the typical identification of Satan's pride. And that is why this pentagram is so deeply emblazoned with the Kabbalah that the ruler of evil author Tapasosi states here. So, then he goes on to say something about the scapegoat. Well, uh, you all know what we use a scapegoat for today, but the scapegoat escaped with his life, his freedom, because he went into the wilderness. That's always the time when somebody's in, someone or somewhat, something is in the wilderness in the Bible. That means a place where the Spirit of God does not dwell. That means where the Gospel is not told. That means where the law of God is not revealed or where the law of God does not rule. That is the wilderness. Like, for example, also the church that has been sent to the wilderness and uh, there was a place prepared for her so that she could survive all these years. But I thought this was a very interesting uh, paragraph to go into because Tupper Saucy doesn't, of course, go into the meaning of the five eyes of Lucifer. And I thought that would be a nice information for you to take along with it here. I continue reading now. King Solomon conferred with evil spirits, but scripture describes the spirits only generally. However, the Zohar, or quote-unquote Book of Splendor, one of the main works of ancient Kabbalistic literature, tells us evil spirits appeared to the Israelites, quote, under the form of he-goats and made known to them all that they wished to learn, unquote. The Templars called this goat idol Baphomet, from Baphi and Metis, Greek words Baphomet, encapsulates the career of Solomon, who scripture says was absorbed into the wisdom of God more than any other human being, yet finished out his life in communion with the he-goatish evil spirits. By the Templar's Johannite standards, communing with the evil spirits was the secret to controlling the world. By the biblical standard, however, Solomon represents the impossibility of human perfectibility. Perfectibility is indeed attainable, according to Scripture, but only through the redemptive process shown in the New Testament, which Rome kept the Templars from reading. So they didn't even have the knowledge of the New Testament. And that's why they're all caught in the Old Testament. It's like the Jews who live under the Torah and think they are doing God's work because they do not accept the New Testament. On March 22nd in 1312, Clement V, Pope Clement V, dissolved the Knights Templars with his decree Vox Clamantis, of war cry. But the dissolution proved a mere formality to further appease Philip. More importantly, it permitted the Templars, in other manifestations, to continue enriching the papacy. For Grand Master Jacques de Molay, just prior to his execution in 1313, sent the surviving 13 French Templars to establish four new metropolitan lodges, one at Stockholm for the north, one at Naples for the east, one at Paris for the south, and one at Edinburgh for the west. Thus, the Knights remained the militant arm of the papacy, except that their wealth, their secrecy, their Gnostic Kabbalism and their oath of papal obedience were obscurely dispersed under a variety of corporate names. A subtle provision in Vox Clementis transferred most Templar estates to the Knights of St. John of Jerusalem, who took possession after King Philip's death. In Germany and Austria, the Templars became Rosicrucians and Teutonic Knights. The Teutonic Knights grew strong in Mainz, birthplace of Gutenberg's press. Six centuries later, as the Teutonic Order, the
the Knights would provide the nucleus of Adolf Hitler's political support in Munich and Vienna. Yeah, it's always Munich, it's always Bavaria in Germany when something bad comes up, because that's all Catholic. The Edinburgh Lodge would become the headquarters of Scottish Rite Freemasonry, which Masonic historian, historians call American Freemasonry, because all but five of the signers of the Declaration of Independence are said to have practiced its craft. In Spain and Portugal the Templars became the Illuminati, in whom Inigo had taken membership at Manresa and the Knights of Christ. Instead of calling it the Illuminati in Spain, you can also say Los Alambrados. A lot of people will probably know that word better for where Inigo de Loyola actually comes from. It was under the red pate cross of the Knights of Christ that Columbus had taken possession of what he called Las Indias for King Ferdinand V of Spain, grandfather of Inigo's discreet patron, Charles I and V, the Holy Roman Emperor. As early as August of 1523, as I hypothesized in the previous chapter, this vast yet fragmented subterranean empire, Roman Catholicism's unseen root system binding together the world, belonged to Inigo de Loyola. His spiritual dynasty, which continues to this day, would use this system to cause God-fearing men who hated the papacy to perform, without realizing it, exactly how the papacy wanted them to. But what of Inigio's education? His rise in academe is subject of the next chapter. But before we continue with the next chapter, I have to back up a little bit again. Because this is really a very important point to quite well to understand, I hope. His spiritual dynasty, speaking of Inigo de Loyola or Ignatius of Loyola, his spiritual dynasty, which continues to this day, would use this system to cause God-fearing men who hated the papacy to perform without realizing it, exactly how the papacy wanted them to. You see, this is another very good example of what the Jesuits are doing today. Jesuitical casuistry and sophistry. That's what they're doing. They are letting you do the things they want you to do and you don't even understand that you are doing things that you don't want to do. <laughs> that's casuistry and that's sophistry. But okay, we're gonna look, have a look at the next chapter, that is chapter 7. It starts with a painting. And uh, instead of that painting, I will put a picture here in the in the video of Pope Paul III declares Loyola's plan for the company of Jesus an act of God. This is taken from a Jesuit altar, the drawing that he made here. But I will put a picture in there and you can see that. Now, the next chapter is called The Finger Stroke of God. And this is really, really important to understand. So... I hope you're all sitting on the top of your chair and are going to listen now. Determined on a priestly life, Inigo de Loyola returned to Barcelona from Jerusalem in the spring of 1524. He spent the next three years in Spain getting the requisite Latin. Since direct contact with the Bible was prohibited by law, his reading coursed the humanities. With the esoteric experience of his spiritual exercises, he charmed the wives of important men. He received frequent invitations to dine at elegant tables, but preferred to beg food door to door and distribute the choice pickings to the, door and the, to the poor and the sick. He lived in an attic and slept on the floorboards, trying desperately to persuade God of his worthiness. He prayed for six hours each day, attended Mass three times a week, confessed every Sunday, and continued whipping himself. He devised secret penances, such as boring holes in his shoes and going barefoot in winter. Sometimes the exercises aroused in his followers instances of bizarre conduct, swooning, long spells of fainting or melancholia, 
rolling about the ground, being gripped with corpse-like rigidity. The Spanish Inquisition investigated him on suspicion of preaching Gnostic Illuminism. When Inigo insisted that he was not preaching at all, but was merely talking about the things of God in a familiar way, the Inquisitor released him. In successive phrase, the Inquisition ordered Inigo first to get rid of his eccentric clothing and dress like other students, and secondly to refrain from holding meetings until he had completed four years of study, and thirdly to refrain from defining what constituted a grave sin. Varying of the harassment, he decided to seek his four years of education beyond the Inquisition's reach. He set out for the University of Paris, with a pack mule carrying his belongings. He arrived at the University on February 2, 1528, and soon afterward registered in the run-down old college of Montaigu. John Calvin, who would become Protestantism's great theological systems designer, was leaving Montaigu just as Loyola arrived. Erasmus, the college's most famous alumnus, remembered graduating from Montaigu, quote, with nothing except an infected body and a vast array of lies, unquote. The student body consisted mostly of wayward Parisian boys kept under harsh discipline. Inigo, at that time, was 37 years old. Paris was expensive, even for students. And I'd like to add, well, probably you see, even at that time, Paris is very expensive still today. <laughs> Much of the funds Inigo had raised in Barcelona had been stolen by one of his disciples. Oops. In early 1529 he went into Belgium, so let me just uh, add here, Belgium at that time did not exist, it was Flanders. Um, Belgium was founded in 1831, if I'm not mistaken, 1830 or 1831. But anyway, he means the place of where Belgium is today. Where it is believed he received money from people close to the Holy Roman Emperor. One of these was Juan de Cuellar, treasurer of the Kingdom of Spain. Another was Louis Vives, personal secretary to the Emperor's aunt, Queen Catherine of England, and private tutor to her daughter, Princess Mary, the one that you call Bloody Queen afterwards, Bloody Mary. Inigo returned to Paris much better off. He upgraded his lodgings. In October, he left Montaigu and enrolled at the College of St. Barb across the street. He pursued a course in arts and philosophy that would last three and a half years. His name appears in the St. Barb registry as Ignatius de Loyola. Some Jesuit historians have guessed he adopted the name in veneration of Ignatius of Antioch, an early Christian martyr. It was at St. Barb that Inigio began earnestly organizing his army, but not before traveling again to Belgium to ask Juan de Cuellar and Louis Vives for yet more money. Armed with his command of the Templar secrets and with instructions provided by the Emperor and Vives, Ignatius crossed to England. This significant voyage is mentioned only once in his autobiography. He admits that he, quote, returned with more arms than he usually did in other years." Unquote. Perhaps Queen Catherine, the Emperor's aunt, introduced him to the Howards and the Petrus, known to be among the first families to receive and nourish Jesuits sent to England. Starting with his two St. Barb roommates, Ignatius soon gathered a circle of six close friends, ranging in age from teens to early twenties. Somewhat like himself, they were adventurous, impressionable, intelligent, and unpersuaded of the Bible's supreme authority. Unpersuaded of the Bible's supreme authority. And they call their society they are going to fund the society of Jesus? What Jesus? The Jesus of the Bible? Huh? Ask yourself this when you come across the so-called society of Jesus in one or other university, high school, or publication 
what the Jesuits are really all about. Here you get that they were unpersuaded of the Bible's supreme authority. Their fondest dream was to save the Holy Land from the Muslims by performing heroic Templaresque exploits. One by one Ignatius gave them the spiritual exercises and one by one they became disciples. Within a few years they were calling themselves La Compagnia de Jesus, the Company of Jesus. On August 15, 1534, feast day of the Assumption of the Virgin into Heaven, the Companions swore oaths of service to the Blessed Virgin in St. Mary's Church at Montmartre and to St. Denis, patron saint of France, in his chapel. The experience of the Montmartre oaths must have been intense for Francis Xavier, who would become St. Francis, Apostle to the East, made the spiritual exercises with quote-unquote a penitential fervor, says Broderick in Origin of the Jesuits, quote, that nearly cost him the use of his limbs, unquote. They vowed poverty, chastity and to rescue Jerusalem from the Muslims. However, should the rescue prove infeasible within a year, they vowed to undertake without question whatever other task the Pope might require of them. So now I have to back up a little bit here to one of his uh, disciples, one of the co-founders of the La Compagnia de Jesus, so as it is called here, called Francis Xavier. Xavier. Pope Francis I did not take his name from Francis of Assisi. He took his name from Francis Xavier, one of the co-founders of the Society of Jesus. He is the highest ranking Jesuit ever to be on the Pope's stool. I don't know if he is really the first Jesuit. You can discuss that. I don't know how much proof is out there. But overall it is said that he even is the first Jesuit. He is a Jesuit of the fourth vow, the oath of induction that we were speaking of already in the other chapters before here. And Francis Xavier was the name giver to Pope Francis, if you ask me. But I'm not putting that out as truth, I'm just putting that out as my opinion, because it makes sense when you are a Jesuit and you take the name Francis, you derive that from Francis Xavier. He could not call himself uh, Pope Loyola, I think. So that was the next best thing. But it's interesting to study this um, this part of history, more certain and a little bit more in depth. But you see what was their intention when they first went to Jerusalem, to take Jerusalem back for the Pope, from the Muslims, that the Pope, the Vatican, invented themselves. But they became unobedient and called the Pope an infidel and didn't listen that well anymore. So, that's why Jerusalem had to be conquered for the Pope once again. I continue reading now. Well before a year had passed, Clement VII died and the Jerusalem dream was overwhelmed by more present dangers. Luther's Bible in German was creating defection in record numbers throughout Germany, Norway, Sweden and Denmark. In France, the response to Lefebvre's Bible was so decisive that King Francis I exclaimed that he would behead his own children if he found them harboring the blasphemous heresies acquirable through direct contact with scripture. England was lost in its entirety, due not to Bible reading, which Henry VIII persecuted as avidly as any pope, but to the royal love life. Henry had demanded Clement VII grant him a divorce from the emperor's aunt Catherine, and then recognized the Protestant-oriented Anna Boleyn as his new queen. When Clement stood mute, Henry took all of England away from Rome and made himself, quote, complete owner of the lands and tenements of England, as well at, at law as in equity, unquote. Clement VII was succeeded by the oldest cardinal, an erudite humanist, with former double diplomatic skills, 
66-year-old Alessandro Farnese. Cardinal Farnese had been privately educated in the household of Lorenzo de' Medici, ring a bell here, and had been appointed treasurer of the Vatican in 1492. He was crowned Pope Paul III. Vatican Vex called Farnese Cardinal Petticoat, because his strikingly beautiful sister Julia had been mistress to the licentious Pope Alexander VI, for which the same wax nicknamed her Bride of Christ. Julia posed undraped for the statue of the goddess Justice that still reclines voluptuously on Paul III's tomb in St. Peter's Basilica. Two centuries later, at the command, in the interests of decency, of Pius IX, the first pope to be officially declared infallible, Julia's exposed breasts were fitted with a metal blouse. Paul III is a major figure in the history of the Society of Jesus, and consequently of the United States of America, since it was he who approved, in the summer of 1539, Ignatius de Loyola's business plan. Ignatius proposed a minimal society that would Quote, do battle in the Lord God's service under the banner of the cross. Unquote. The militia would be very small, no more than 60 members, and each would have to take four vows of poverty, chastity, obedience to the church, and a vow special obedience to the Pope. They would not be confined to any specific parish but would be dispersed throughout the world according to the papacy's needs. They would wear no particular habit, but would dress according to the environment in which they found themselves. They would infiltrate the world in an unpredictable variety of pursuits, as doctors, lawyers, authors, reforming theologians, financiers, statesmen, courtiers, diplomats, explorers, tradesmen, merchants, poets, scholars, scientists, architects, engineers, artists, printers, philosophers, and whatever else the world might demand and the church require. Their head would be a superior general. In the constitutions which Ignatius was writing, the superior general would be, quote, obeyed and reverenced at all times as the one who holds the place of Christ our Lord." Unquote. The phrase, quote-unquote, holds the place of Christ, means that the superior general would share with the Pope, at a level unperceived by the general public, the divine title of Vicar of Christ, first claimed in Galatius I on May 13, 495. Loyola's completed constitutions would repeat 500 times that one is to see Christ in the person of the superior general. The general's equal status with the Pope, advantaged by an obscurity that renders him virtually invisible, is why the commander-in-chief of the Society of Jesus has always been called Papa Nero, the Black Pope. The superior general's small army would be trained by the spiritual exercises to practice a brand of obedience Loyola termed contemplativus in actione, active contemplation, instantaneous obedience with all critical thought suppressed. All critical thought suppressed. You don't think of your own anymore. You act like a cadaver. All comes back. And that's in the constitution of the Society of Jesus. You can read that online. As stated in section 353.1 of the exercises, <coughs> quote, we must put aside all judgment of our own and keep the mind ever ready and prompt to obey in all things the hierarchical church, unquote. But Jesuit obedience would be more than mere obedience of the will. An obedient will suppress uh, an obedient will suppresses what it would do in order to obey what a superior wants done. Ignatius demanded obedience of the understanding, and obedient understanding alters its perception of reality, 
according to the superior's dictates. Section 365.13 declares, quote, We must hold fast to the following principle. What seems to me white, I will believe black, if the hierarchical church so defines, unquote. Francis Xavier would later describe this quality of submission in a vow that unintentionally summarized the Jesuit mission. Quote, I would not even believe in the Gospels were the Holy Church to forbid it. Unquote. The society does not open its extreme oath of obedience to public inspection. However, a script alleged to be a true facsimile was translated by Edwin A. Sherman and deposited in the Library of Congress with the number BX 3705.S56. According to this document, now this goes back into the reading of the Jesuit oath, and I will continue that, but I just want to make a little point that uh, some time ago I made a video together with Michael Adams under the name of Nothing But The Truth, and um, that, title, that video was titled uh, about the extreme oath of induction of the Jesuits. There we go for a two-hour video explaining everything that is said in this, um, in this oath, and that goes even deeper into that what I can read right here, but this right here is now very interesting. So, according to this document that is in the Library of Congress, when a Jesuit of the minor rank is to be elevated to command he is conducted into the chapel of the covenant of the order in the uh, of the convent of the order where there are only three others present the principal or superior standing in front of the altar on either side stands a monk one of whom holds a banner of yellow and white that is by the way the vatican flag which are the papal colors? Okay, thank you. <laughs> and the other a black banner with a dagger and red cross above a skull and crossbones with the initials I-N-R-I. And below them the words Ixtum Neca Regis Imios. The meaning of which is, quote, It is just to annihilate impious rulers, unquote. Biblically, this initials represent the Roman inscription above Christ's head on the cross, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. On the floor is a red cross upon which the postulant or candidate kneels. The superior hands him a small black crucifix, which he takes in his left hand and presses to his heart, and the superior at the same time presents to him a dagger which he grasps by the blade and holds the point against his heart, the superior still holding it by the hilt. The superior gives a preamble and then administers the oath. I, and now fill in your name, now, in the presence of Almighty God, the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Blessed Michael the Archangel, the Blessed Saint Paul, and all the saints and sacred hosts of heavens, and to you, my ghostly father, the superior general of the Society of Jesus, founded by Ignatius of Loyola in the pontificate of Paul III, and continued to the present, do by the womb of the Virgin, the matrix of God, and the rod of Jesus Christ, declare and swear that His Holiness, the Pope, is Christ's vice-regent and is the true and only head of Catholic and universal church throughout the earth, and that by virtue of the keys of binding and losing given to his holiness by my Saviour, Jesus Christ, he hath power to dispose heretical kings, princes, states, commonwealths and governments, all being illegal, illegal without the sacred confirmation, and that they may safely be destroyed. Therefore, to the utmost of my power, I shall and will defend this doctrine and His Holiness's right and custom against all usurpers of the heretical or protestant authority, whatever, especially the Lutheran Church of Germany, Holland, Denmark, Sweden and Norway, and the now pretended authority of churches uh, and, and churches of England and Scotland, 
and branches of the same now established in Ireland and on the continent of America and elsewhere, and all adherents in regard that they, me, that they be usurped and heretical, opposing the sacred mother church of Rome. I do now renounce and disown any allegiance as due to any heretical king, prince or state named Protestant or liberals or obedience to any of their laws, magistrates or officers. I do further declare that the doctrines of the churches of England and Scotland, of the Calvinists, Huguenots and other of the named Protestants or liberals to be damnable and they themselves damned and to be damned who will not forsake the same. I do further declare that I will help, assist and advise all or any of His Holiness's agents in any place wherever I shall be, in Switzerland, Germany, Holland, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, England, Ireland or America, or in any other kingdom or territory I shall come to, and do my uttermost to extirpate the heretical Protestants or Liberals' doctrines and to destroy all their pretended powers, regal or otherwise. I do further promise and declare that, notwithstanding I am dispensed with, to assume any religion heretical, for the propagating of the Mother Church's interest, to keep secret and private all her agents' counsel from time to time, as they may entrust me, and not to divulge, directly or indirectly, by word, writing, or circumstance, whatever, but to execute all that shall be proposed, given in charge or discovered unto me, by you, my ghostly father, or any of his sacred convent. I do further promise and declare that I will have no opinion or will of my own, or any mental reservation whatever, even as a corpse or cadaver, but will unhesitatingly obey each and every command that I may receive from my superiors in the militia of the Pope and of Jesus Christ. That I will go to any part of the world whithersoever I may be sent, to the frozen regions of the north, the burning sands of the desert of Africa, or the jungles of India, to the centers of civilization of Europe, or to the wild haunts of the barbarous savages of America, without murmuring or repining, and will be submissive in all things whatsoever communicated to me. I furthermore promise and declare that I will, when opportunity presents, make and wage relentless war, secretly or openly, against all heretics, Protestants and liberals, as I am directed to do, to extirpate and exterminate them from the face of the whole earth, and that I will spare neither age, sex or condition, that I will hang, burn, waste, boil, flay, strangle and bury alive these infamous heretics, rip up the stomachs and wombs of their women and crush their infants' heads against the walls in order to annihilate forever their execrable race. That when the same cannot be done openly, I will secretly use the poisoned cup, the strangulating cord, the steel of the poignard or the leaden bullet, regardless of the honor, rank, dignity or authority of the person or persons, whatever may be their condition, in life, either public or private, as I at any time may be directed to do so by any agent of the Pope or superior of the Brotherhood of the Holy Faith of the Society of Jesus. In confirmation of which, I hereby dedicate my life, my soul, and my corporeal powers, my corporal powers, and with this dagger, which I now receive, I will subscribe my name, written in my own blood, in testimony thereof. And should I prove false or weaken in my determination, may my brethren and my fellow soldiers of the militia of the Pope cut off my hands and my feet and my throat from ear to ear, my belly opened and sulphur burned therein, with all the punishment that can be inflicted upon me on earth, and my soul be tortured by demons in an eternal hell forever. 
all of which I, insert your name here, do swear by the blessed Trinity and blessed sacrament, which I am now to receive, to perform, and on my part to keep inviolably, and do call all the heavenly and glorious host of heaven to witness these my real intentions to keep this my oath. In testimony thereof I take this most holy and blessed sacrament of the Eucharist, and witness the same further, with my name written, with the point of this dagger dipped in my own blood, and sealed in the face of his holy convent. Now he receives a waiver from the superior and writes his name with the point of his dagger dipped in his own blood, taken from over his heart. When Ignatius concluded his presentation, the Pope reportedly cried out, Hoc est digitus Dei! This is the fingerstroke of God. On September 27, 1540, Paul III sealed his approval with the highest and most solemn form of papal pronouncement, a document known as a bull, from the Latin bulla, meaning bubble, denoting the attached ovoid or circular seal bearing the Pope's name. Paul's bull ordained the Jesuits its uh, ordained the Jesuits is entitled Regimini Militantis Ecclesiae or in English on the supremacy of the church militant this title forms a cabalistic device common to pagan roman divining known as notarigon this device is an acronym that enhances the meaning of its initialized words in the way M.A.D.D. Mad told, tells us that mothers against drunk drivers, M.A.D.D., are more than against drunken drivers, they are very angry. Regimini Militantis Ecclesiae reproduces the notaricon R, brackets O, M, E, R, M, E, O in the middle, Rome, the empire whose salvation the Society of Jesus was ordained by this bull to secure through the arts of war. The following April, the original six and few other members elected Ignatius de Loyola, their first superior general. What had been approved as a minimal society soon multiplied to a thousand strong. Ignatius died uh, Ignatius did this by administering to only sixty the extreme oaths of obedience to the Pope, while admitting hundreds more under lesser oath. E ever since, the exact size of the society has been known only to the superior general. As the world gained increasing numbers of doctors, lawyers, authors, reforming theologians, financiers, statesmen, courtiers, diplomats, explorers, tradesmen, Merchants, poets, scholars, scientists, architects, engineers, artists, printers and philosophers. It was extremely difficult for an ordinary citizen to tell which were Jesuits and which were not. Not even Jesuits could say for sure, because of a provision in the constitutions in the sections 81 through 86 of part 1, which authorizes the superior general to, quote, receive agents both priestly agents to help in spiritual matters and lay agents to give aid in temporal and domestic functions, unquote, called co-adjutors. These lay agents could be of any religious denomination, race, nationality or even sex. They took an oath which bound them, quote, for whatever time the superior general of the society should see fit to employ them in spiritual or temporal services. Unquote. This provision was availed by so many black popes that the French had a name for people suspected of being Jesuit agents, Le Probe Petite, short robes. The English called them short coats or Ignatians. Within two years of Regimini Militantis Ecclesia, Paul III appointed the society to administer the Roman Inquisition not to be confused with the Spanish Inquisition, which reported only to the Spanish crown. When the Jesuits were comfortable with the Inquisition, Paul made his move to reconcile with the Protestants. And this finishes the reading of uh, chapter 6 of the 
book of rulers of evil, chapter 7, sorry, of rulers of evil, called The Fingerstroke of God. Hoc est digitus Dei. This is the fingerstroke of God when he heard Ignatius' oath. Thank you very much for listening and watching. See you next time. Until then, God bless you and bye-bye.